Hi all, um, this video is going to go along with the outline that I posted for the hero's journey and it also is going to be a resource that you'll need um, in order to complete the assignment uh, that you see below, um, the hero's journey in a movie assignment. Um, so I'm going to go over each step and I'm going to connect it to Fahrenheit 451 and I will also try to make some references to stories that uh, you might be familiar with as well. Um, the nice thing about the hero's journey or what you may find is the annoying thing about the hero's journey is that it's present in basically almost all movies, TV shows, a lot of books that you will read, and even video games. Um, and you can kind of also even use the steps to kind of like outline different uh, stages of your life, um, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. Um, so I'm just going to pull up here for myself the steps. You probably will also want to pull the steps up uh, so that you can kind of go along with uh, with what I'm talking about on your own or at your own pace. Sorry, I'm just gonna, I've got to split a screen here so you can make it a little bit smaller. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna go over the outline first and then I'll briefly touch on the archetypes, which is on the second page. Um, you're gonna need to be familiar with these steps uh, because you are going to uh, need them for your assignment. Uh, and then also we're gonna have a couple of texts that we'll read over the next two weeks um, that will also uh, cover some of these steps as well. So the very first step is um, going, oh, before I get ahead of myself, if you can remember back to uh, the Odyssey, this will probably also help you because you probably talked about the hero's journey a little bit um, in ninth grade when you guys were going over the Odyssey. Uh, similarly, when you get to your junior year, you guys will go into even more depth with the hero's journey. So we kind of talk about it every year, but we get a little bit more complex every year. Okay, so the very first thing, the very first step in a hero's journey actually happens usually a lot of times before the story even happens. It's an unusual birth or an unusual childhood. So something unusual happens during this character's early childhood or maybe during their birth that sets them apart from others that exist in the ordinary world, okay? The ordinary world is the world where the character lives, okay? Um... <clears throat> This character can be completely unaware of the unusual birth or unusual childhood, or they can be kind of uncomfortable with the way that they feel because of it. Um, so in Fahrenheit 451, we don't actually know if Montag had an unusual birth or an unusual childhood. The only clue we have that might point us to an unusual childhood is that he remembers things from his childhood. Um, when Clarice mentions the way the leaves smell or the way the moon looks, he is reminded of uh, a memory from his childhood. When he steps out of the river and imagines the barn, um, and he, he remembers the smell of hay and whatnot from some distant memory when he was a child, that maybe points to the fact that he was maybe like an exceptionally observant child, kind of like Clarice is very um, observant, and so maybe that's an unusual childhood for him. The classic example of an unusual birth or childhood would be Superman, okay? And actually even Batman too. Um, so Superman um, was born on Krypton, and then he was sent in that like spaceship meteor down to Earth, and... Um, and basically never knew that he was from another planet until he was much older. Um, so that was an unusual birth that he had, and it set him apart from other people um, who lived in, in his uh, hometown, um, Smallville, which was in Iowa, is that right? I can't remember. Um, so the next step, and this will probably actually be the first step that you really see in the story. A lot of times that unusual birth or childhood is kind of like some backstory that you're aware of. The next step is called to adventure. So something's going to shake this character up, shake up the situation. Um, can either be external pressure or something rising up from within so that the hero must face new beginnings or change. Okay, so think about... 
Montag, um, and this actually does happen before the story starts. Remember that he already has these books up in this grate in his house. And so uh, the very first book that he stole, that would be his call to adventure, okay? And the call to adventure goes right along with the second step, which is the refusal of the call. There will be this call to adventure, and most of the time the character hesitates, okay? In different movies and different stories, the hesitation period uh, can be very short or it can be much longer. For Montag, we can assume that his his hesitation was much longer because he's been stealing books kind of uh, periodically for a while. He just hasn't acted on them at all. He hasn't ever been prompted to really think about what it means to own a book, what it means to read a book. Um, so he had the call to adventure, which was stealing the book. He had the refusal of the call early on before the story starts by... <coughs> sorry, um, by not acting on um, stealing that book, okay, not really taking it any further. That's his refusal, okay, probably because he knows that there's a danger in it, and he's afraid of what will happen if he's caught with the books, if he um, maybe becomes more knowledgeable, um, that it will be very obvious to other people. Um, the next step is meeting the mentor, and really this step can occur... Uh, before the call to adventure, it can occur after the call, but before the refusal, um, or it can come after the call and the refusal. That part can kind of move around, but it does happen in the ordinary world, okay? Um, meeting the mentor is when the hero meets a seasoned traveler of the world, okay? So of the ordinary world and of the special world. The ordinary world is where the character lives, knows all the rules about the special world he hasn't been in yet. But the mentor has, okay? You have two mentors in Fahrenheit 451. You have Faber, who Montag actually met way back before the call to adventure but then just like never did anything with his information. And then you have Clarice. And Clarice is the one that really sets the whole action in motion. We talked about how Clarice, meeting Clarice was kind of like the inciting incident in the story. Um, and so that's meeting the mentor. The advice that they get from the mentor or the information that they get is kind of like this special weapon. Um, and it will help the character throughout the journey. One interesting thing about mentors, and if you're familiar with like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, uh, Star Wars, any of those movies um, or books, you have like Gandalf, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Yoda um, are all mentors, and even Dumbledore, okay? And they give the character the special weapon, okay? And a lot of times it's like information about how to deal with uh, the issues that are going to arise but then they like disappear so like if you've seen lord of the rings gandalf is there and he uh, imparts his wisdom on frodo and the other members of um of the fellowship but then he disappears okay and i won't give too much away but like in the hour of their need um he's gone he can't give any more counsel and so they have to take the tools that gandalf gave them and even though they're not really sure how to use them yet uh, they've got to kind of fend for themselves um, and so this happens with obi-wan kenobi it happens with yoda they're kind of like intermittently throughout in the story um they're not they're not right next to the character throughout the story so anyway the character will meet the mentor before they cross the threshold so remember a threshold is that thing uh, that's at the bottom of your door frame so that when you open and close your door you can see the separation either of rooms like if it's going from carpet to hardwood or if you're going from the indoors to the outdoors those thresholds are a little bit more built up because you're trying to keep weather out um, and so the character is going to do the same thing you do when you walk out a door they're going to cross the threshold the only difference is instead of walking from the inside to the outside they're going to walk from their ordinary world into the special world. And the special world is the world where they don't have any tools except maybe what the mentor gave them, but they don't know the rules to the special world. Think about in Thor, Thor's from Asgard, 
and he gets banished to Earth, right? Um, and he can't use his hammer once he's on Earth. The Earth is his special world. We know that Earth is like a weaker world compared to Asgard, and that Thor is actually very strong, but he's nothing on Earth in the beginning. He doesn't know how to play by Earth's rules, and so Earth is his special world. Um, and so this can also be, um, like in Fahrenheit 451, the ordinary world would be the society that like Mildred adheres to, okay? The, the rules that she follows, um, just kind of this follow all the rules that the government puts into place, believe the propaganda, um, you know, basically entertain yourself to oblivion. Uh, the special world would be the world where you basically become a reject of society, which is the threshold basically that Montag crosses uh, when he decides to start reading the book that he stole uh, from the house um, where the lady lit, lit the fire herself. Okay, that, that is crossing the threshold. It's not actually a different world in his case, okay? Um, it's the same world, it's just that in the ordinary world, he plays by society's rules, and in the special world, the special world is kind of uh, ruled by people who are rebelling against society and this idea that they can't read books, okay? So he has to learn how to basically negotiate that world. Um, so, crossing the threshold is like the inciting incident, kind of. Uh, I'm just going to show you this here really quickly to hopefully remind you, and I think this is going to show up backwards. Um, so, there's a plot diagram, which you should remember. So, uh, in the beginning, you have your introduction, you have your inciting incident, and then you have your rising action. The rising action takes a really long time. Okay, and then you get to the climax, and then, ah, uh, can't do mirror images. And then you do the falling action, which is much shorter, and then the denouement or the resolution. So the rising action, interestingly, in a uh, hero's journey, is very long. It takes up most of the movie, but it's really only like two steps, okay? So the steps that you're going to cover during the rising action would be the tests, allies, and enemies. And then as you get to the top here, to the climax, you're going to get to the ordeal. So... Um, test allies and enemies. I want you to think about like every single action movie that you've ever seen. Think of all the like mini battles where the um, like cronies, I guess, of the bad guy uh, kind of like are easily defeated and the hero becomes stronger in this new world. Okay. Um, this is also the time when you kind of discover who the main uh shadow is the main antagonist so if you think of you got, i know you guys a lot of you have seen marvel movies there are a lot of marvel movies and we didn't even know at the beginning when they first started coming out that really they were all going to add up to this one uh movie about thanos okay and that thanos was really the main shadow the whole time and so uh all of the movies, like if you if you watch them all end to end, they would basically be this rising action all the way up to Endgame, okay? And so Endgame would be the ordeal where the character actually finally faces off with the main shadow or the main antagonist, okay? So those tests uh, that happen during the rising action, those are going to be... Uh, like small battles they're going to be when you figure out who the enemies are they're also going to be when the character figures out who his or her allies are okay um and this is where they meet a lot of characters too so it takes up even though it's just one step it takes up the majority of the story then you get to the ordeal the ordeal, I'm sorry, let me go back to talking about Fahrenheit 451 and what his test allies and enemies would be. Um, test allies and enemies would be him reading with Mildred, him reading the poem to Mildred's friends. Uh, remember, he kind of treats Mildred as an ally, 
but then she later turns into a shadow or his enemy because she and her friends turn him in to Beatty. Um, it's where uh, Montag has this whole discussion with Beatty, where Beatty kind of seems like he's on his side, um, where the mechanical hound comes sniffing at his door uh, when he goes to meet Faber and finds out that Faber can be a mentor and can also be an ally to him. Um, these are all, it takes up the majority of the middle of the book, um, and these are the tests, the allies, and the enemies, okay? Um, that leads us to the ordeal. The ordeal is a test, but it's like the biggest test of the whole uh, movie. Um, so this, it says happens around the middle of the story. It's kind of like middle end. Um, the hero is going to enter this central space in this special world, and they're going to confront death or face their greatest fear. Um, this can be... Uh, you can have an internal conflict, this, so this could be facing themselves. Uh, it could be facing an abyss, which would be like a deep problem. Um, it can also be facing a temptation, maybe a temptation that's going to turn them to the wrong side. Okay? Um, this is the climax of the plot. Okay? This is the very top of this diagram. Um, and then out of this ordeal is going to come this transformation. The hero is really going to be transformed into the hero after they overcome the ordeal. Uh, so the reward is your next step. And it's not always a physical reward. In fact, a lot of times it's not a physical reward. In the King Arthur stories, when King Arthur pulls the sword from the stone, that's a physical reward and gets the sword, becomes king. Um, but a lot of times the reward is something less physical. It's maybe, uh, I don't know, like a new found um, ability to overcome whatever that shadow was. Uh, if you think about like Harry Potter, um, it's the ability maybe to control his magic. Uh, for um, Luke Skywalker, it's, uh, again, that... Um, kind of like development into a Jedi that he's being resurrected or I'm sorry that his reward basically is the skills that he needs in order to become a Jedi um, in the first movie which is actually the fourth if you the first movie that came out which is the fourth movie of Star Wars uh, the reward could also be the fact that they save Leia um, so again, not not like a physical thing that he gets to take back. Instead, it's it's a person that he's able to save. Um, there can be a celebration, but there's also danger of losing that treasure again. Okay, and so this happens on the road back, um, and the road back is where. Uh, the hero needs to complete the adventure and leave the special world, but there's going to be like one last little tribulation that's going to happen on the way back. This could be a chase scene in an action movie. Um, this could be something like an ally dying, uh, which is going to try the hero mentally because they've lost um, the person that had their back. Um, but basically, it's like a danger to the mission, okay? Um, then you have the resurrection. So this is uh, when, back during the ordeal, when the hero was severely tested, uh, he's going to be tested once more as he uh, hits the threshold of his home, okay? And... Um, they're going to be purified by that last sacrifice. And so it's kind of like a moment of death or rebirth. And um, that gives them, like, transforms them into a higher level. So think of, like, this new level of greatness or this new level of godliness even. Um, think about Thor when he's finally able to um, overcome the obstacles of Earth and kind of regains his Asgardian powers again. He is being resurrected back to uh, that elevation of godliness. 
Um, and this is on the threshold returning back to the ordinary world, okay? So now what you have is a character who's come full circle. The character knew how to behave in the ordinary world at the beginning. They didn't know how to behave in the special world. They didn't know how to survive in the special world, but now they do. They've conquered the special world, okay? And we'll talk about that here in just a second. When they ret um, return to the ordinary world, they're returning with an elixir, okay? This is like the treasure, um, sometimes it's something physical, uh, sometimes it's like knowledge, which I'll talk about here in a minute with Montag, um, and then uh, it's going to help, I guess, transform that world in some way, um, which will then also elevate that character to hero in his ordinary world as well. Um, and so then you have this mastery of two worlds situation. And so this is where the hero takes experience from the special world and... Uh, reconciles it with the knowledge of his ordinary world, and he's the master now of two worlds. Now, like for Thor, this works out fine. He can survive on Earth. He can survive on Asgard. He does a great job both places after the movie ends. Um, for other characters, they can't ever really return to the ordinary world in a normal way. Um, if you think about Lord of the Rings, Frodo never really fits back into the Shire again. He's seen too much. He can't really live there anymore. Um, and there are other characters like this too. Um, Luke Skywalker is like this, um, especially if you've seen the newer movies. I won't give too much away, but if you've seen them, then you know like he can't live in the regular world anymore. He's not, um, he's elevated beyond that. Um, so that's basically your mastery of two worlds. So I'm just going to go over this briefly with Montag. The last steps after the ordeal, the reward, the road back, resurrection, return of the elixir, and mastery of two worlds all happen very quickly in movies, okay? And sometimes they can happen pretty quickly in books. Um, remember that if we're looking at the plot diagram, that that falling action is much shorter than the rising action. I mean, gosh, if you guys have seen um, The Lion King, you guys will know, like, the whole movie is rising action, rising action, rising action. You finally get to the fight scene with Scar. Scar dies. That's the end of the movie. Like the rain basically is the falling action. Um, and so sometimes these steps get breezed through really quickly, um, which happens a little bit in Fahrenheit as well. So where am I going? <clears throat> For the ordeal, the ordeal in Fahrenheit 451 would be when Montag is fleeing society, when the mechanical hound is actually on his tracks and he's trying to make his way to the river without the mechanical hound catching him first. Um, once he jumps in the river, then he's essentially escaped, okay? Do you remember, though, when he gets out of the river? Um, well, the first thing I'll say is that the reward is that he was able to escape society with the book of Ecclesiastes still in his head, okay? So he's kind of memorized this book even though he doesn't know it yet. So he's got the reward, okay? The um, road back is when he steps out from the river and um, he has that fear that the mechanical hound is there, but then it turns out to just be a deer, okay? Um, even though that wasn't an actual threat to him, like there was never a mechanical hound there, it was his own mind really that was causing that tribulation that happens on the road back. Um, and it was endangering him, um, probably like through paralysis. If he would have just like chickened out, I guess, then, um, then that would have been the end of the story and he wouldn't have been able to take that reward that he has um, and help society with it. But he got over it, realized it was just a deer, and then was able to move forward. Um, so then we get to the resurrection, and this is where the character is going to cross back over into the ordinary world. Montag meets the professors. Uh, that's kind of a long part. That's part of the road back, um, and discovers that they all have those books in their heads, um, and that one day society will need them again. Well, that happens very quickly because the city that he's just escaped from uh, gets basically demolished by an atomic bomb. And so I guess like that last 
uh, test basically on the threshold would be where the atomic bomb explodes and then they're kind of all like thrown to the ground and washed over with all that dust and debris. Um, that would be kind of like that last uh, tribulation. And it's kind of symbolic too because they get covered in the dust of the city um, and then emerge from that cloud like still alive and ready to go back to the city. So they're ready to return with the elixir now and the elixir is that knowledge that they have in their mind, okay? It's also the fact that all of those people, the professors in Montag, they know from experience what the ordinary world's rules are. They know how to play by those rules. Montag used to be just like Mildred. Um, so he knows how to talk to people like Mildred, okay? Even though he didn't do a very good job in the book, um, now, you know, he's going to be able to use those skills, go back and talk to the survivors, and eventually they'll be able to rebuild society. And so they're going to be able to rebuild society because they have the elixir, they have the reward, they have the books in their heads that are going to help them rebuild society in a new way and heal it from what it was earlier in the book. And so now Montag is the master of two worlds. And that's basically it. Um, archetypes, I'm going to go through real quickly. Heroes are your central figures in the story. This is Montag, obviously, in Fahrenheit 451. Um, Mulan, uh, Simba, Luke Skywalker, Frodo, um, Harry Potter. You know, a multitude of different characters that you guys are probably aware of. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of shows that I'm not touching on at all um, that you guys are probably even more aware of than I am where you guys could identify who the hero was very easily. Um, a hero does not have to be a man, even though I've said he many times. It can be a female also. Um, it you know could be anyone. Um, but it does have to be the person that the story is about and that all the conflicts are kind of happening to. A shadow is how you refer to a villain in a hero's journey. Um, they're villains and enemies. So you have your ultimate shadow, like in um, the Avengers movies, is Thanos. Thanos is the ultimate shadow. But you have all these other shadows that kind of um, occur or show up in the rising action as well. Uh, so if you think about Star Wars, like Darth Vader is your main shadow although is he really maybe the emperor is the real shadow um is the main shadow and then you have like all the stormtroopers which are obviously also shadows um but they're like very minor because they are blasted very easily um you also have in star wars luke luke's mind is a shadow sometimes as well so a character's mind can be a shadow to them um, if they are trying to overcome some kind of problem. So if they have like repressed grief or anger uh, or frustration, then that also is going to act as a shadow in the story. And that's where we get this like uh, character versus self, character versus society, character versus character, and why some uh, stories that we read seem to have all of the conflicts. Um, all of those act as shadows. Mentors, we already talked briefly about mentors. Um, this is Yoda, Merlin, Rafiki, Gandalf. Uh, in Batman, it's Alfred. In Superman, I think it's uh, Superman's father, like his biological father, but then also his adoptive father. They're both mentors to him. Um, the herald can be a person or it can be an object. So a herald is the one that brings the call to adventure. In Theron Height 451, it's Clarice. Clarice is both a mentor and a herald, okay, which is not unusual. You can have characters that kind of uh, cover both categories. In Harry Potter, it's the letter to Hogwarts is the herald. Um, and in Star Wars, it's R2-D2. Threshold guardians, uh, they're going to be uh, forces that stand in the way at important turning points. So when the character is trying to enter into the special world, there might be a threshold guardian. When they're trying to enter uh, back into the ordinary world and they have that last kind of tribulation, that also can be a threshold guardian. 
Um, in Star Wars, it's Luke's own mind when he's trying to train with Yoda is his threshold guardian. Uh, Heimdall in Thor, which is the guy who wields the sword that like goes into the Bifrost portal. I'm sorry, I'm butchering this explanation. But if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. The guy is played by Idris Elba, um, and he opens up the Bifrost, and that's how Thor is able to go to different worlds. The, he's like a literal threshold guardian. Um, Fluffy in Harry Potter is a threshold guardian as well. Shapeshifters are characters that can literally change shape. So it could be vampires and werewolves, or it could be characters that flip-flop from side to side. Ultimately, if you have a character that's flip-flopping from side to side, they will eventually choose a side, okay? So they'll either be a good guy in the end or they'll be a bad guy in the end. Um, Mildred is a shapeshifter, okay? Montag thinks of her as an ally, but then she turns out to be a shadow because she turns him into the police. So she's basically a very good example of what a shapeshifter is. Sirius Black and Harry Potter and Catwoman and Batman are also good examples of shapeshifters. Um, tricksters, these would just be like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck or Timon and Pumbaa. Again, they could be uh, enemies or they could be, they could be shadows or they could be allies. Um, they basically represent like uh, or they, they can also be represented in, in a mischievous uh, subconscious um, in a character that maybe has a lot of internal conflict. And then the very last archetype is allies, which should be easy for you guys. These are sidekicks, buddies, girlfriends, boyfriends, anybody who's going to advise and help the, the hero throughout the story. So we talked about in Lord of the Rings how Gandalf kind of like abandons um, the fellowship in their hour of need which is, he's the mentor, he gave them tools. Sam is Frodo's ally throughout because he's there by his side no matter what. Um, he's always there, he's always helping. Yeah, he's just as bad uh, with the skills in the special world as Frodo is, but he's there to help Frodo along the way. Um, Ron and Hermione and Harry Potter are allies. Um, in Mulan, her three buddies are her allies, even though they were kind of, they're like tricksters and were maybe seemed like they could have been shapeshifters early in the story. Um, they definitely end up being her allies by the end. So again, you can have some crossover there. And that's it. That's a hero's journey. Um, have fun watching a movie this week and trying to figure out what all of those steps are. I do not need you to give me an explanation of who each of the archetypes are in that story. Instead, what I want you to do is basically just give me like a sentence or two about each step um, in that particular movie. And then like if the mentor is part of that step, then you might say so-and-so, the character's name, and then you could put in parentheses who is the mentor and then go on with what you're talking about. So should be kind of fun, um, but I do know that it takes a little bit of time uh, to record all of these steps. I'm going to give you a whole week to do it. That way you can watch the movie or the TV show uh, that you need to uh, a few times if you need to in order to get all the steps written out. That's it.